to introduce me, but he, I think he has a, other duties. <laughs> so if you were here earlier, you saw me. I'm uh, Christina Corp. I'm known as the Astronaut Wrangler. And there's actually a video that I have that I would really like to show, and it'll give you a little bit of a, um, a tiny bio and uh, um, some visuals of a recent event that I produced in uh, London for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16. Can you guys roll that video at the AV desk? Do you know what I'm talking about, guys? Hi, I am Christina Corp, and I am known as the Astronaut Wrangler. I managed Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin for 10 years, and that welcomed me into a world of many, many, many astronauts. We all have a shared purpose to raise awareness about all the ways that space benefits all life on Earth. I became the witness to the impact of Apollo and what it did for the world and how we all benefit from it today. So the reason I wanted you to see that is because that is one of the ways that I'm trying to attract more people like me, more people who used to be or are outside of uh, the space realm, to think of space as something that's exciting to be a part of and also it was a very, very quick flash, but you will see that I actually brought 11 astronauts to London. Six of them were women. I had six female astronauts and five male astronauts. And the reason that that matters is because even in America and in other places, there's still usually male astronauts on stage. There are not as many female astronauts in general, but there also aren't as many who are asked to come and speak at events. So this is why this is so ex uh, exciting for me and Dr. Proctor is because a lot of times women don't get asked to speak at these uh, space events. So when we do get asked to speak, we are eager to have this opportunity. So, so I wanted to share that because uh, the panel that I am moderating is women empowerment. Um, I think that space in general does a better job than a lot of industries as far as including women, but we still have a ways to go. Um, so we're gonna bring up a panel of ladies today, to, uh, leader, leaders in space, female leaders in space, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about ways that they got into space, and hopefully also some advice uh, for young women and girls who want to enter the space realm. So I'm going to introduce each uh, uh, panelist, and then I'll let them tell their own little bio about themselves and share information. So first, I'd like to welcome to the stage my friend, Dr. Cyan Proctor, who is a SpaceX astronaut, as you met earlier, and the mission pilot for Inspiration4. <laughs> Next, I would like to um, invite my other space sister, Shelley Brunswick, a COO of the Space Foundation. And I'm not sure if the others are all virtual or if we have any more of the other ladies here. Um, so if I miss it, oh, we've got, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, is this Dr. Fatima? Dr. Fatima Zora, I'm gonna say this totally wrong. Eflahin, Eflahin, Eflahin. She can connect, correct me when she gets up here. <laughs> Thank you, welcome to the stage. And then I believe the other uh, two panelists are, um, Actually, I guess there's three more. Dr. Hind Buya, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. I think she might be um, virtual. Ms. Kathy DeMarcos and Dr. Hajar Munsanif. So I'm probably saying them wrong. Please don't hesitate to correct me um, if I say them uh, incorrectly. So why don't we start with the panelists on stage and again, we'll just give each of you ladies an opportunity to Maybe tell about yourself and just briefly whatever you might want to share leading up to um, or how you got to space. Do you want to start again? Yeah, I see they're shifting since we only have three of the ladies here on the panel. So um, should I come and sit with you ladies? Yeah, that sounds more fun, doesn't it? All right. Kathy, can you hear us? All right. Well, what, you know what? Since since we got you, Kathy, why don't we start with you? And you can explain, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, just give us your short bio. Thank you, Christina. It's such a pleasure to actually be here amongst 
incredible, inspirational women. I'm based in Australia. I'm a global business advisor. So my exposure to space is actually quite limited. However, the way that space actually impacts the whole world, humanity, is something that I actually live by in respect to the way that I show up in life and more importantly, how I actually work with our future generation, with women in business, and more importantly, in how we can also contribute to developing countries and enable them to actually step up and be part of that conversation as well. So that's just a really short snap. Um, thank you, and I'll pass it back on to you, Christina. Thank you. Uh, can we, do we have the other ladies on virtual? We may as well stay in the virtual realm and then we'll come to the ladies on stage. Dr. Buya or Dr. Mansanuf? I, I can't say this. Moon Sanif? Oh, she's not here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hind uh, Buya, is that how you say her name? Buhia? Is she here or do, or do we only have Kathy virtually? Just the one? Okay, well, there you go. That makes it easy. All right, ladies, it's on you then up here. <laughs> you want to go first, Cyan? Sure. Uh, and so uh, a lot of you got exposure to my space story. It started. You can hear me okay? Um, and it started with an early age with my family, my parents. Neither of my parents had college degrees. My dad was very um, adamant about us, um, you know, becoming educated, investing in lifelong learning and, and exploration. And so as a, as a young child, I just remember both of my parents being very open to me as an explorer and going out and investigating the world around me, um, but also looking up at the, at the night sky. And I remember vividly when I got my first telescope and um, with my dad and being able to, you know, see things, um, to dream about uh, what, is, what is beyond Earth. And, but also when I think about uh, what got me into space, you know, it, it, of course it was that early exposure to my dad's history with NASA, seeing the Neil Armstrong's autograph, but also science fiction was a big thing for me. I grew up watching Star Trek with my dad, with my siblings, uh, and for representation, uh, L Lieutenant O'Hara was representation for me because there were no black female astronauts. But being able to see something like, you know, science fiction, a, a TV show that represented humanity going to space and not in a, you know, a Star Wars capacity of fighting our way across the galaxy, but in this Star Trek idea of a federation working together and being able to, ex to boldly go where no human has gone before. And that idea has always captivated me of, of how do we all come together uh, on Starship Earth to boldly go where no human has gone before. Shelley? Well, I want to thank Dr. Sharif for the kind intro. Um, I always like to say my journey has three chapters. So I enlisted in the US Air Force right out of high school because I didn't have college money to go to school, I didn't know what I wanted to major in, I, did, I didn't know what I wanted to even do with my life. And so the Air Force offered an opportunity to see the world. So um, I've been stationed in Turkey and Germany and been all over, so I've, I've really appreciated that part of my journey with the Air Force. I also, as an enlisted person, I was a uh, human relations. I was a uh, uh, personnel specialist, so I learned a skill. Um, and then the Air Force offered an opportunity called tuition assistance. So although I joined the Air Force to earn money to go to college when I separated, they also paid for part of my college to go to school at night. So I took advantage of that and I went to school at night and earned both my bachelor's and master's degrees while I was an enlisted airman and then applied to become an officer because I met the requirements. But the challenge was I don't have a STEM degree. I'm not a scientist, technology engineer, or mathematician. I have a degree in business. So at the time, the Air Force was looking for STEM professionals. So my opportunity of being selected was only 12%. So not very good odds. And those of you who are watching JLo and Ben Affleck, they just got married in Vegas. And on 12% odds, you should not go to Vegas and gamble. 
But I did apply anyways, and I was not selected to be an officer in the Air Force. And I could have said, okay. But the Air Force allowed your application to be received and reviewed a second time. So I went ahead and updated my application so that it was fresh letters of recommendation, fresh statements of why I should be selected. And the second time is when I was selected to be an officer in the Air Force, but not only an officer in the Air Force, but a space program manager. And that's what started my 25-year career in the space industry, was the Air Force made the decision. And I will let you know, I didn't want to do it. Because I was in personnel. I wanted to be a personnel officer. All my friends were in personnel. It's what I wanted to do. Right? You always want to do what you know. What's this space thing? This, oh, I don't know what that is. I don't want to do it. And finally, the Air Force said, this is what we need you to do. So I did it. And it's been the best decision somebody else has ever made for me in my life. And so when people tell you to follow your passion, don't listen to that. Because had I done that, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be a personnel officer somewhere doing assignments for somebody going from Turkey to Colorado or something. Instead, I'm a space person and I'm here with you today because somebody else didn't think I should follow my passion and I should be open-minded to try new things. So that's a little bit about my story. Uh, good evening. I'm blessed to be with uh, wonderful ladies <laughs> and amazing ladies as you all are. I'm not from space sciences. I'm not a STEM uh, person. I don't come from engineering nor from um, uh, medicine nor from maths nor from physics. I come from human sciences. <laughs> and maybe it's a good thing to balance uh, the panel to come from human sciences. But uh, I think I share with you the passion, the passion of believing in one's dreams. I also grew up in the 60s uh, with a father and mother who, whom I look upon as being way more liberal and way more independent than we can see today, not only in Morocco, not only in the Arab world, not only in the Muslim world, but also in every other part of the world. And. Um, they believed in the importance of education. They believed in the importance of education for girls and for boys. And they believed in the power of work, of thrift, of striving, of reaching up for one's dreams. And I think that this is the best we can give kids. Sometimes you follow your passion. You shouldn't follow your passion in your case. <laughs> in others, well, passions can be different. They can be diverse. You can start things and then move on to other things. I picked up a certain number of things and uh, ended up uh, um, a professor at the university, which I love. I think it's uh, something that is uh, wonderful because you can, there's so many things to share and so many things to learn, so many things to learn uh, from young people. And that's it. But I think that um, I grew up with a strong-headed mother. It's important. <laughs> Women who can, um, who can dare uh, reach out for their dreams and, and speak up and voice out their, their concerns, their needs, their uh, whatever they would like to. And I think this is a, a wonderful thing for young people today to be able to do. And uh, I think that, um, again, many things I'm proud of also is I'm the second vice president, woman vice president of my university, which is not easy. And for <laughs> research, uh, which is usually something that goes towards uh, men colleagues, quite never towards women colleagues, and coming from the human sciences is even something that is rarer to happen, to become a vice president for research as somebody who comes from, and again, that's true everywhere. It's not just because we are in Morocco. So yeah, this is a great opportunity to be uh, sharing things with you this afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I I'm gonna go ahead and share my unconventional pathway. I mentioned it earlier, but I, I am one of 10 children. I have five brothers, four sisters. I grew up in a very poor family in South Dakota. I don't know if any of you know where that is, 
But if you know our mountain, Mount Rushmore, that has the presidents on uh, heads on the mountain, that's where I grew up, 20 minutes from there. That's where actually most of my family lives. And I often say that I think that the reason I'm such a strong, I'm so shy, clearly, right? Um, I'm a very uh, strong, outspoken, I'm not, I'm not afraid to speak up. My dad didn't treat the girls any differently than the boys. Um, and I think that that honestly is what helped me hold my own in a room full of men. I've never been intimidated by being in a room full of men. I have five strong brothers, so, um, so I think that's part of it. You know, my dreams, my passion was to become a rock star. I was trying to become a rock star. I was, grew up in a family of musicians and artists. I toured all over the world. I, I, at first, I was in a family band with my sister and my brother and my dad. That's a whole other story. But I went to Los Angeles to try to become a rock star. And I did have some success. I did make a couple of records. And I sang with Ringo Starr from the Beatles. And I, I got to do a lot of really exciting things in, in uh, music. And I produced TV specials uh, in, in the USA. And I was in them. Um, and then I decided I needed a break. And that's when I answered an ad to work for Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin. So this was not the plan for my life at all, <laughs> to work in space. And the interesting thing is, for me, it was just a change, and I thought it would be something that I would do for a couple of years. And, you know, I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But it opened me up into this whole world that I realized I developed a passion for. So that's another like thing, which is I had a passion that I was pursuing, and then I had this major like right turn, left turn, whatever you want to call it, into this world that was not something I ever would have thought was possible for me. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, I'm a musician, singer, a media, entertainment person. But I also saw an opportunity to be a part of telling the story of those who create uh, really interesting and exciting uh, ways to get to space. And, and Buzz Aldrin's uh, experience of using gravitational assist to swing around planets to get to Mars and Moon. I know more about Moon and Mars missions than I ever wanted to know. But the point is, though, that I, I like to tell young people, and this is where I want to lead into with each of you ladies, is. You know, I always tell them, try to do lots of things. You may think that you have to have your life all planned out, but I've been telling you, you do not. No one has it figured out. There are gonna be lots of things that come your way. You should try lots of things. Don't be afraid of failing and, uh, and give everything a shot. And so that's what I would like to get um, from each of you panelists now, is what would be your best advice, especially to women and girls who might wanna get into space or, or space realm in, in any field? You wanna start? No, Cyan wants Fatima to start. <laughs> Don't you ever let anybody tell you you cannot do it. Don't you ever have anybody impress you but what you can do or what you cannot do because as you said I mean you can fail but okay fine and then what you fail you you, you, you get up you learn from your failure and then you're just, you're just as intelligent as anybody else and the problem is we do not raise our daughters our girls to or educate our uh, the girls to believe that they can do it we always expect from women to say how they succeeded and why they succeeded. Look at this pattern. We need to explain why we, we made it or why we're here. <laughs> Nobody did before us this, this morning. They did not have to explain why they made it, but we do always have to explain why we are here and how come that we are here and what, what things we had to do to, to become what we are. So yes, I think that uh, that's part of it. So I, I like the slide where it showed because I was jotting down a few, a few notes and I, th there was a connection. Sensitize. We need to sensitize girls that they can do it, they can make it. And then that there is, of course, there is a sensitize that there is a glass ceiling, but sensitize that it's only a glass ceiling and that glass can be broken and that you need to break it if you want to go uh, up and... Uh, uh, on your dreams. Shelley? 
So one of the things I learned when I worked on Capitol Hill, so I worked on Capitol Hill as an Air Force liaison to um, the US Congress to secure the budget for the Air Force. And during that assignment, I had a boss who said, life is all about relationships. It's about building and maintaining relationships. And so during our lives, sometimes we don't think about this. Sometimes this comes across as a dirty word called networking. And you're told, oh, networking is something we don't do. But in the space industry, it's even more important because although space is very grand, the space industry is very small. And so building relationships in the space industry, networking with people that are in the space industry, ISU is an amazing organization with a great network and alumni, Space Generation Advisory Council, Women Tech Network, UNUSA Space for Women, Space Foundation. There are organizations that you can network with that can help you find your way into the space industry. They can help you find mentors, and mentors can help change your life. But it's also about maintaining that relationship through time. It's not about a one-time thing. It's about building that relationship and maintaining it. I still have relationships. I left Capitol Hill seven years ago. I still have relationships with people that I turned on to go into the space industry. They worked on Capitol Hill, now they work in industry or they work somewhere else. And so they're still a connection for me because I might need something at one of the agencies. So build those relationships, but maintain them. And it's a two-way street. Sometimes people come to you for help, and sometimes you go to them for help. And that's all about building that relationship. Thank you. Uh, you know, you said something that really resonated with me, and that's you know building relationships and connections because one of the talks that I always gave was uh, the power to connect. You know, what is the difference between networking and connecting? And connecting is when you actually go deeper into a relationship with somebody, when you truly Recordings, connect with them. Recording in progress. We're recording. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I look back in my life, and I look back at all of the opportunities that I've had, I would easily say 90% of my opportunities have come from other people. Where other people, when it came to NASA and the NASA selection process in 2009, I didn't even know how NASA selects astronauts. Somebody sent me a note that said, NASA's looking for astronauts, you should apply. And the fact that they thought about me for that opportunity. Uh, you want to put yourself in a position where you're sharing your, your aspirations and your desires out there so people know who you are authentically. And then when they see opportunity, they, want, they think of you, and they will send you that opportunity. So um, NASA astronaut selection process, recommended by somebody else. Living in the Mars, uh, NASA-funded Mars simulation for four months, recommended by somebody else. Even Inspiration4, my mission to space, they announced it during the Super Bowl. I didn't watch the Super Bowl, <laughs> but you could, you, you'd be amazed at how many of my friends texted me immediately and said, you could win your seat to space. And so you, you, when you make connections, you, you are opening up the avenue for opportunities, but you still have to take that opportunity. So when all of those people were sending me these, these things, I had to take and believe in myself that I could go and, and take advantage of this. Now, I suffer from imposter syndrome. Some of you may have heard of that. It's, the, it's that voice inside your head that fuels, fuels you with doubt, where you see an opportunity and they're like, you're like, oh my goodness, they'll never select me. I'm not good enough, I'm not qualified enough right now. And, and a lot of women have that voice inside your head. You, the best thing that you can do is learn to combat that voice by having a conversation with it. So early on, I started thinking about this conversation I was having when I, I, I would hear this voice say, you know, they'll never pick you for the NASA astronaut selection process. And I would think, okay, you know, that's probably true, but what if they did? You know, or what are the, what are my fears here? Or what are the consequences of a no versus a yes? And, and really digging into um, how you flip that narrative so that it's not about no and closing those opportunities, that it's yes, I'm gonna take this opportunity and if it doesn't turn out the way I thought it should be or I hope it should be, 
I'm still going to learn and move forward from it because it's, it, it's, it's a learning experience for myself. And as a result of that, I will be one step closer to my dreams. Um, uh, to add to that, I will say, when I applied for the Buzz Aldrin job, first of all, I just thought, eh, what have I got to lose? If I don't apply, I don't get it. If I apply and I don't get it, I still don't get it, but maybe I learned something. The other thing is people would always say to me, how did you get this job? And I'd say, I applied. And they'd be like, man, I wouldn't have the guts to do that. So <laughs> it's that simple sometimes. By the way, I don't suffer from imposter syndrome. I feel like it, I deserve to be here. I worked my butt off to get to where I am. <laughs> Yay. So, so I, th I think we have Hind here now. Um, I think yeah. she joined us. So yes. So would love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, it was such an honor to be with you. And look what I have in my bag. Isn't that amazing? I had to be somewhere close to a space simulation to feel that I'm part of That's where this I amazing. live. <laughs> I know. Isn't that amazing? I, it was not at all in the plan. I was supposed to be sitting by your side, but it's just such an honor to meet you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharif, for making this possible, even through Zoom. You know, I grew up in Morocco. My name is Dr. Hain, and I started as an engineer, and my dream has always be, been to be an engineer. And so... I believed in it because I wanted to be like my father. I thought, why wouldn't me? Wouldn't I choose something that mostly men do? And so what I did, I just worked hard. I woke up. I remember my mom would put us to sleep. I was 16, early to bed, and I'll just wake up and I do math exercises and physics because I knew that the best way I can do, I can be accepted, is by being the best in my class and the best in my school. And I did that. So it was. I had a drive in me because. I believe that I too can be an engineer like all the men are. And that was my belief when I was young. So I did that because I choose to excellence. And I, that's what I teach women today is that choose excellence and make excellence your brand. And no matter what you want to become, no matter what you want to do, you'll reach it. But you'll reach it by do by working for it, by proving you can. And, you know, I love what you said about, uh, you know, you need to claim what you want. So one day I was sitting down and I didn't speak English. We speak French and Arabic in Morocco, as you, you know. And so I thought, I want to go to Harvard. That was my dream. And I just looked at the skies and looked at the stars. And I said, you know, wishing on a star, literally what I did, I said, I'm going to Harvard. And I believed in it. And so... I kept on working hard and applied, and I believe that I'll be there, and that's what I did. So I went to Harvard to finish my environmental engineering di di diploma, and um, and after that worked on development. And but my message to to girls and to women is really to never shy away from science and math. They are accessible, and today it's not even a luxury, or it's not even. And maybe it's a must to have them, must to do them, must to master and to feel comfortable and natural around math, physics, and science and technology, because otherwise you'll miss, be missing out on what's happening in the world, because the world has turned digital. And if you want to be part of it, if you want to have a role in it, if you want to lead in it, you have to have science early on. And that's come, by, come down to education, to educating girls, to, to um, programs that show girls that science is beautiful, is amazing, is fascinating, and it's accessible. And just make changing that mindset around being it hard, being it too complicated, being it just for others, will make a huge difference for the next generation. And that's why all those programs for Girls Who Code, Girls Understanding Space, I mean, your initiative today is just amazing. It's so impressive. And it shows that it's, uh, there are amazing and beautiful women like you who've reached that level, who made, that, made their life around, um, you know, being astronauts, being the space, uh, the head of the Space Foundation, all those, you know, amazing leadership positions that you are holding, you are role models for every girl. And more we can share the experience is more you will inspire, we will inspire other girls, you will inspire other young women to follow the same path and to create their life of their dreams as well. So that's uh, just amazing. <laughs> Thank you. It's so funny that you're in my home, where I live in Orlando, Florida, and I'm where you are from in Morocco right now. Um, exactly. 
so Kathy, um, Kathy's in Australia, which is one of my favorite countries. And um, Australia has a really, really rich heritage of Apollo, actually. They had the tracking stations that were critical to the success of the Apollo missions. And Australia was actually the country that um, received the signal from the moon when Apollo 11 landed on the moon and then transmitted that signal to the rest of the world. So obviously um, Australia has had a heritage with uh, space, but it still was primarily men. So Kathy, I would love to um, have you, first of all, I mean, were, were you inspired by the Apollo missions? Did you, were you even aware of that? Did that you know, get you I, into space? How did you get there? And then what are you doing now in Australia uh, in relation to women in space? Are you involved in women's organizations? So I, I absolutely do remember that moment. I remember um, being in the office. Um, my background is finance. And at that particular time, I remember arriving in the office and I had this incredible, overwhelming f um, feeling. Just, I, I was engulfed. It landed. It was like, it's landed, you know. Um, it was so surreal. And I still feel that now, you know, look, looking back on that moment. The one thing, I'm not heavily involved in space, but the, the philosophy of what thinking about space is, the way that I actually, I work with people, having that, you know, belief in just looking up into that night sky, and we all do it. We all do it, it's from children th right through to adults. We look up into that night sky and we go, I wonder what's really out there. And that actual belief in looking up that inspires us to really ask the question of what else. And I often say to people, please don't ask what if. What if closes that opportunity for you? It, it elicits that doubt. When you ask what else, it creates that opportunity to explore. And that's what space does. That's what science does, right? So for children, it actually elicits that curiosity of wanting to know more. It has that imagination, that creativity that actually just comes to fruition. But life, somehow, it just squashes it out of us when we become adults. And, you know, somebody said earlier that there is this fear of failure. I mean, most of the time, people actually are fearful of starting something. Um, failure for me is a celebration. Think about how many times anybody who has dared to try something different has failed just to get to that place of uniqueness. You know, that's what space does. It actually creates that opportunity for um, trying something, you know, anti-fragility, I live by that. I, I say to people, push through resiliency, you know, start to be anti-fragile because then you actually bring in that mitigating risk, that second and third order thinking where you're prepared to go, you know what, I've tried that and that doesn't work, but I can do this, right? So if we start in showing you know, our future generation, showing girls what's possible. It's the only reason why I have become visible. I, I'm i not an extrovert, um, Christina. I'm, I'm an introvert. I like to be behind the scenes and I love to allow other people to shine. But when we were going through the pandemic, I had almost catastrophic moments happening around me. Um, my father was actually unfortunate to have a horrible fall in hospital that led to a brain bleed. The day before my father passed away, my mother had a heart attack. We then went into full lockdown in Australia. And I sat there and said, what else? What else can I possibly do? There's something more to do. And I think sometimes moments of crisis or or doors opening are about us looking at what do we really want to do? What's that impact? Now, um, we talk, you talked about passion earlier. I talk about impact. If you know the impact that you want to make out onto the world or into the world, then you can create that roadmap and actually take others with you. And I think as females, that's one thing that we do really well. We have the ability to bring others on a journey with us to collaborate to actually then um, elevate 
and make sure that whatever it is that we're actually working towards, everybody's actually going to come on that journey with us. Um, I'm not quite sure who actually said earlier those relationships. Shelley, it may have been you that talked about those relationships. We hold on to those relationships. And so as females, that's an opportunity for us to really think about who, who do we know or who else might know somebody that can bring somebody on board. When we open a door, it's not just about opening a door for us, it's actually about opening the door for every woman, for every girl, for everybody that can actually think about what else to create that impact on humanity. Space is about that. You think about that helicopter view. When you're out in space, you're looking at the earth from a different lens. When you're in it, you look at things really differently. So for me, it is everybody here, you know, is showing the world what is possible, not just for us as females, but for us as collaborators for us as leaders and for us to be championing everything that's possible. Um, and I, like you, Christian, I don't suffer from imposter syndrome. I, I don't like to use the term because I think it then creates the space for that to then occur. So let's shatter everything. Let's actually shoot things out into space and let's bring everybody on that journey with us. So I've gone around in a big circle, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight about who I am and how I actually work with um, our future generation. I also run leadership programs, guys. Think about the developing nations that actually have never considered being an astronaut. When we take something from the Western world and we can actually plant the seeds at grassroots to that young generation, everything is possible. So. For each of you here today, you are actually creating that roadmap. You're being seen, whether you're an introvert like me or an extrovert like Christina. By being present here and Dr. Sharif, you have created the platform for all of us to have a voice. You know, I'm incredibly grateful. I'm, you know, a quiet business person in Australia. And look at the forum that we're actually creating here. Look at who's present. This is actually an auspicious moment where women are actually being heard. So thank you. No, thank you. I mean, it's interesting. You're in finance and that could be in a whole other road we could go down because finance is um, quite a big uh, uh, space investment is quite a big deal right now. Um, but I guess what I would like to do, though, is actually, you said, I'm not a space person, but the field that you work in is actually a very important part of going into space. Um, life sciences, human factors, that sort of thing. So, I mean, do you, through all of this discussion today, do you see how what you're doing plays a role or, or, or as an avenue to, for, for young women especially to come into space? is um, very few people know uh, you know that astronomy and, and space sciences are very famous in this part of the world uh, many people know uh, I'm sure here know about um, Al Biruni about uh, Khawarizmi about a certain number of um, male figures or, or, or men in astronomy but uh, very few know that the founder of the first university, the, 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 probably the first university in the world in the ninth century was a woman. It was Fatima al Fihriya, Ummul Banin. And she was a scientist. And amongst other sciences, she knew astronomy and she taught astronomy. And she was called, she was nicknamed Fatima Ummul Banin, Fatima, mother of of children because she I mean she believed into the uh, power of transmission she uh, founded the first university ever in the ninth century in Morocco al Qarawiyin that still exists today very few people remember that one of the um, important women also is uh, probably uh, Maryam al Astrolabia Maryam al Astrolabia is the this is a word that should ring a bell, astrolabes. 
<laughs> she developed astrolabes. So yes, there are women scientists, and there are women mentors, and there are women figures in history all around the world. It's just that history does not recognize, doesn't want to recognize that women are part of shaping. They have been part of shaping the world of sciences, the world of technology, the world of human sciences, etc. So I do believe that we have roles to play, that we are role models to young ladies, wherever you are, we are from our respective positions, whether, whether they are leadership positions, but of course when we are at leadership positions, we have a responsibility towards uh, young, young girls and ladies and boys also for a better world, for a world that is more just, more equal, a Jedi. I love this. I'll, I'll, I'll use it. <laughs> I take permission of using it. Of a Jedi world, of Jediization, of, instead of whatever it is called, of the world, uh, globalization or whatever, but of, of, of uh, a world that is more just, that is, that is more equal, more diverse, more inclusive, etc. And this needs, of course, I think uh, that men and women are educated alike uh, because it's, it's, I mean, of course, education is very important here, but education, uh, girls and boys, education for sciences. And again, when you look at the figures, in most universities in Morocco today, the ratio, the, the male to female ratio in, in STEM is in favor of girls. We have way more girls in, in engineering, in maths, in physics, in medicine, in technology than boys. At entry level, uh, also in, 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 of course, in performance, when you, when you study the performance, you see that, that, uh, that girls outperform, they outnumber and outperform boys, but what happens? As you climb the ladder, whether in labs, whether you are a senior researcher or, or a junior researcher or a young lady uh, entering college, as you grow the, the, uh, you know, the ladder in, 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 in research or in teaching or in, or in learning, uh, you see the pyramid <laughs> being inverted and then you see less and less girls. So of course there are many, many things that, that are responsible for this. We all know them. And of course, the power of women in leadership, I think, is not only to be role models, but also to advocate for more funds for women in research, for more visibility for women in research and, and sciences, whether space sciences or others, for, for uh, uh, more uh, dignity. For, because it's, it's not just a question of uh, space sciences, of course, have implications for many other things in, 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 in life. And, and I, I like to think and to say that Arab astronomers were looking out at the space and translating it in real life in the world. And uh, throughout the history of Islamic astronomy, you will see this. It was translated into the real life of people. So I think that our scientists today, whether male or female, women and men, I don't like that word, male and female, <laughs> women and men should make science that is translated to real life. Of course, it has implications for, for uh, energy efficiency, for uh, food security, for uh, medicine, for telemedicine, for many things. But I think it, most of all, has an implication and a meaning for dignity and for human rights. Because education, equal, inclusive, diverse education is a question of, simple question of human rights. And you see that you cover all the 4, 6, 17 SDGs. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you brought up an interesting thing, though, about women not getting the recognition. I mean, I, I do a lot of projects in the USA where I do giant art projects that um, celebrate women. And I, when I say giant, I mean giant. Like I did a, a project last year for World Space Week 
where I uh, commissioned a crop artist to make a giant eco-friendly grass portrait of a NASA astronaut named Stephanie Wilson. She was the second black woman to go to space. She had the most, until recently, she had the most days in space for any black woman ever. And it was 7,000 square feet. I partnered with Georgia Tech and 14 public schools in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. And the whole point of it was to try to uh, raise awareness in a, in a big way, to get people's attention that she's a real woman, she's a, a real person, this wasn't a fantasy, this is someone who actually was doing it and is actually still a current NASA astronaut. So the thing is, I think that uh, one challenge that I find sometimes is you're right, the women don't get the recognition. And, you know, Cyan uh, understands, and I would like you to talk about this, you know, there's the statement of if you don't see it, you can't be it. And I think that that's, that's why all of us are here, though, also, is to be able to say, look, we did get to a place of leadership, but we want to help explain that you can get there, too. It, it's not just us. You, there are pathways there. But of course, there are challenges as well. But I'd love for you to um, explain, like, you, you're very aware. You're a black woman in space. There aren't very many of you. And what do you what do you feel is uh, the biggest challenges for women, especially women of color? Oh, that's a that's a long. That's a big question. I know. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is, um, in in this is particularly in the United States, when I walk into a room, what people see is a black female, and and a woman of color. And so they don't know that I have my PhD. They don't know that I've spent 20 plus years as a geoscience professor with a specialty in science of disasters. They don't know that I have this rich space heritage that's a uh, legacy from my family or that I'm a, I got my pilot's license or scuba certified or that I was almost a NASA astronaut. And that then they certainly don't know that I'm the, the you know, the first women of color to pilot a spacecraft. And, and what comes with that is that they have all of these assumptions already from me just walking into the room of who they think I am and what I have accomplished and what I am capable of. And, um, and it's, it's exhausting to have to use your resume every single time you walk into a new environment um, to be heard, to, to be recognized, to um, you know, have a seat at the table. And, uh, and I think that that's one of the things when I talk about a Jedi space, you know, how do we get to the point where when people walk into a room, all we don't see gender, color, you know, um, ethnicity, we see potential. We see opportunity, we see collaboration, we see all of these other things. I, I mean, it, it, our number one asset is our uh, human um, capital, hu humans, you know, uh, collectively, what we can do, our ability to imagine and create is astonishing. Uh, but we let so many other things get in the way of that. And, and so that's one of the reasons why I think it's imperative when we're talking about, you know, how we can think about space and space exploration as the, the uh, optimal idea of humanity with that Jedi space as the foundation. But as we go to the moon, Mars, and beyond, you know, I say solving for space solves for Earth. But what we're really doing is solving for Earth. And if we're going to create a Jedi space out there, that means we can create a Jedi space here on Earth. Well, and Shelley, and I'm not sure how much time we have left. How are we doing? Do we need to finish? OK, well, I guess they will see. As you can see, we could probably talk about this all day long, ladies, right? Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for participating. And I'm sorry we didn't get more time with you. I think we. Uh, just we're a little bit off on the timing, but it's wonderful to have you, and especially as Thank a representative you. for your, from, we're all in your country, so we're I know, to isn't that amazing? That's the universe, you don't know how it works. I was supposed to be sitting with you, having you over for, in my house, but we'll do it next time, definitely. Yes, but this is an amazing, and I'm so honored to have you in my country and, and showing to every young girl, every young woman what's possible.
and having them train. So you are bringing such a joy, such amazing possibilities for everyone. And I think that is so beautiful and so grateful for that. Thank you, Dr. Sherry. Thank you to ISS School for doing this. And we'll meet again with Shelley and with all of you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Kathy, as well, from Australia. And thank you, ladies, Fatima, Shelley, Cyan. Thank you very much, Dr. Sherry. Fatima, nice to meet you. Sending you love.